ownership of real property. Um, and I found this graphic a couple of years ago, unlocking the home ownership puzzle. It, it, it kind of is a puzzle. You know, I, right at the end of the class last, yesterday afternoon, I shared with you that um, the estates we covered, the estates are dictated by law. On the other hand, ownership is dictated by our personal situation. Whether we're married or not, whether we're one or two people, or whether we're 14 people, wanting to buy some land for a hunt club. So let's go ahead and get into this. We start off um, talking about soul ownership. And the word soul simply means ownership by one person or a legal entity. So the word soul itself means one. This kind of ownership is called ownership in severalty. And the word severalty, the root of the word severalty is the root is the word sever. And the word sever means to cut or separate. So the way this is being used is if one of us owns property alone, solely in severalty, we have cut everyone else's right to own that property. Okay. That's the way the word's being used. Ownership of one person or a legal entity. And of course, a legal entity is a corporation, a limited liability company, a partnership. And legal entities own property as if they're one individual person. So one individual person or one legal entity own property in severalty. Concurrent ownership, ownership by more than one person or entity. The word concurrent means at the same time, okay, at the same time. So ownership by more than one person or a legal entity at the same time is concurrent ownership. You know, if you're watching the news and you hear that somebody was convicted of a crime and the judge has sentenced them, if the judge sentenced them, sentences them to two 10-year terms to be served concurrently, they're only going to do 10 years because they're going to serve the two 10-year terms at the same time. If the judge wants to keep them in prison longer, the judge should sentence them to two 10-year terms to be served consecutively, one after the other. So concurrent ownership, two or more people or two or more legal entities. Okay. So if in fact, Harris Teeter and Academy Sports owned all this land the shopping center's on. They owned it together. That would still be concurrent ownership. Now, I'm not saying they do own it, just using that as an example. So we have different kinds of concurrent ownership. We have tenancy in common, tenancy by the entirety, and joint tenancy. And notice right away that we talked yesterday afternoon about the fact that the word tenant doesn't actually mean renter. The word tenant is someone who holds an estate. And evidence of that is here we are talking about three different kinds of tenancy and we're talking about ownership. Just wanted to point that out. So these are the three different kinds of concurrent ownership that are possible in North Carolina, okay? Now, before we get into the three different kinds individually, I wanna broach the topic of survivorship. You have to understand what survivorship means. So survivorship 
if one owner dies, the surviving owner has full ownership immediately and automatically. Okay, immediately and automatically. Survivorship is not inheritance. So survivorship doesn't have to go through probate. Survivorship is not inheritance and survivorship is not taxed. So when we say it's immediately and automatically, what we're saying, you don't even have to do any paperwork. Now, in reference to the three forms of concurrent ownership, tenancy in common cannot have survivorship. And in your book, this is right in the middle of the page, strung out in a table. Tenancy in common, survivorship, the law won't allow it, it's prohibited. Tenancy by the entireties must have survivorship must have survivorship, the law demands it. And joint tenancy, it depends, okay, it depends. Now, before we do get into this, I wanna point out under the table, I've got two lines there with the check marks. Brokers must never advise buyers on how to take title, that's practicing law without a law license. Brokers should always advise, advise buyers to consult an attorney regarding title. Now, that's a fact and you need to know that. But what's also a fact is that in my 28 years in the business, I have never had a buyer ask me either how they should take title or how they're gonna own the property. It just never comes up. Um, unless they've taken a course like this, they don't even know to, that they could ask or they don't even know there are different forms of ownership. I'm convinced more than 90% of the people other than they, they know they own a property and if they're married, they probably think they own the property together. But as far as how, what the legality of it is or the actual terminology of it is, they have no clue. And that's okay for the average person, but that's not okay for the real estate professional. So we're gonna start with tenancy in common. Two or more people buying property who are not married, okay, who are not married will own property as tenants in common. It's this will happen automatically. They don't have to ask for it. The attorney's not going to ask them if this is the way they want to own it because this is how North Carolina law works. Two or more people. 14 people buying, you know, acreage for a, a hunt club, they'd be tenants in common. There can never be survivorship. The law will not allow it. The ownership interest does not have to be equal. It usually is, okay, it usually is, but it doesn't have to be. It's referred to as a fractional undivided ownership of real property. Fractional in parts, undivided is treated as one. So how in the world does that work? It's in parts, but it's treated as one. So let me explain. Let's just say two people buy a hundred acres of land together and they're gonna be tenants in common. One of them has an 80% ownership interest and the other has a 20% ownership interest. So the first thing I'm gonna tell you is what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean one owns 80 acres and the other one owns 20 acres. They both own the whole 100 acres. 
That's why it's undivided. The fractional part of it is when they purchased it, one of them paid 80% of the purchase price and one paid 20%. While they hold the property, one of them pays 80% of the expenses, the other one pays 20%. Property taxes, insurance, utilities if there are any. It means when they sell it, one will get 80% of the sale price and one will get 20%, but they both own the whole 100 acres. How they actually use it's between them. Fractional undivided ownership. Each owner may force a partition. Okay. Each owner may force a partition. So I'm going to quickly explain or try to do it quickly what a partition is, but understand you're not going to be asked about what it is. You just need to know in tenancy in common, each owner can force a partition. So another way of saying each owner can force a partition would be an owner can't be held hostage in the ownership. If they want to get out, they can get out. So here's an example. Okay, we've got these two people, one has 80% ownership, one has 20%, and, and they could be 50-50, they could be equal, doesn't matter. But the guy with the 20% wants to get out of the ownership. So the logical thing to do would be to call his, his partner, his fellow owner and say, hey, I'm tired of this, I wanna take my toys and go home. Buy me out. Why don't you just buy my 20% and I'm out of here. But the owner doesn't want to do that, the other owner, because he likes him paying 20% of the expenses. So he says, no, I'm not going to buy you out. Sell it to somebody else. Well, what do you think the odds are of selling somebody a 20% interest in something? Pretty low. He tries it, doesn't work. He can go to court and ask the court to force a partition. If the land can be divided, that's one alternative. So one of them gets 80 acres, the other one gets 20 acres, or if they're 50 50, they split it in half and the court partitions the land and then the one owner can sell his 50 acres or whatever it is. But if that can't be done, what if there's a house on this land? You can't cut a house in half. Then the court could actually force the sale of the whole property and divvy up the proceeds according to the ownership interest. So that's what a partition is. Somebody wants out, they can get out. Even if that means going to court. All you need to know is that any owner may force a partition. Each owner may sell or encumber their interest. Each owner can sell their interest to someone else or each owner can borrow money against the property, but they can only borrow the money up to their ownership interest. So the guy that has the 20%, he can only borrow 20% of what the property's worth. That brings us to the second form of concurrent ownership in North Carolina, tenancy in the entireties. So let me clear one thing up, this word entireties. It can be written in the entireties, by the entireties, of the entireties. The entirety can be a singular instead of a plural, can end in a Y. It doesn't matter. It's all the same thing. It, you just see it written all different ways. So I, I wanted to put your mind at ease about that. Okay. A married couple buying property in North Carolina will own property by the entireties. North Carolina has a law that requires that. Okay. That's the way it works in North Carolina. Now, they can insist on another form of ownership, but that's extremely rare because there's no reason to do that. 
possible only for a legally married couple. And the only reason I stress that is North Carolina does not recognize common law marriage. So it has to be, you know, marriage license, marriage certificate has to be legally married. It always has the right of survivorship. And the survivorship cannot be defeated. It can't be overturned. It can't be circumnavigated. You can't get around it. The law won't allow that. If one of the spouses writes a will leaving the property to somebody else, the will's not enforceable. It won't work. This is a marital protection in this form of ownership. Okay. It is the favored form of ownership in North Carolina for married couples. Now, what does that mean, favored? Doesn't mean they had a poll or a survey. That's what most people like. It's what the law provides for. That's the language that's used. It's legally favored. It's what our laws provide for. And again, I keep saying in North Carolina, most states don't have this form of ownership. Okay. Survivorship is not inheritance. Doesn't go through probate, it's not taxed. You don't even have to do any paperwork. When one spouse dies, the surviving spouse immediately, automatically has full ownership rights in the property. A legal concept in common law, you have to understand. It only takes one person to buy a property, but it takes two people to sell property. So the explanation, if an individual owns real property in severalty, remember that sole ownership, if an individual owns real property in severalty and then gets married, or if one spouse buys property in severalty, just because somebody's married doesn't mean they can't buy property individually, they can. But either way, okay, so she owned the property in severalty and then gets married, or she is married and she buys a property in severalty, she's gonna have to get the spouse's signature on the deed or she can't transfer clear title. And this is true in most states. And of course, if he can't transfer clear title, guess what? Nobody's gonna buy the property. Questions on this? Okay. Oh, and, and by the way, the, the person owning property in severalty, it doesn't matter how they got the property. It doesn't matter if it's given to them, they bought it, they inherited it, doesn't matter how they got it. Just all that matters is if they own it in severalty and they're married, they're going to have to get the untitled spouse to sign the deed or they can't transfer a clear title. So you're saying, just let me make sure I send no questions, but so if she owns it before they are married, once they're married, it's automatically they need two signatures, his signature as well to sell. Correct. All right. And, and understand this. The untitled spouse doesn't own the property. There's no ownership. They can't do anything with the property. All they have to, but you can't transfer a clear title without that spouse's signature. If you, what would this, what does this prevent? Uh, it prevents a spouse from hiding ownership of property. Okay. Gotcha. All right, now, something else you need to know. If an unmarried couple buys property, how will they own the property? This was the first ownership we covered. 
unmarried couple buys property, how are they going to own the property? In tenancy in common. Tenancy in common. Okay. Then they get married. After they purchase the property, they get married. The form of ownership does not automatically change the entireties. So why is that important? It's important because they won't have survivorship. And the, you know, the real problem here is most people think they do. There's all kinds of horror stories about people who, who bought the property together as a couple, but they weren't married. They're tenants in common. A year later, they get married. Five years later, they have two kids. And then one of them gets killed in a car wreck. And the surviving spouse ends up owning 50% of the property with a brother-in-law who was an heir to the deceased spouse. So now you've got a brother-in-law and the surviving spouse with two kids sharing ownership of a house. And typically the only thing you can do to fix that is sell the house, divvy up the proceeds. And now the surviving spouse with two kids doesn't have anywhere to live. And all of that happened because they made an assumption about something they didn't know anything about. So what if they got, like they bought this land unmarried and then when they got married, could they sell it, like sell it like one spouse, sell it to the other spouse and then it come to be? No, they don't have to do all that. Okay. Okay, they don't have to do all that. All they have to do it's get an attorney to change the form of ownership. It's probably going to cost 50 bucks. As a matter of fact, and, and what the easiest thing for them probably to do is to go to the attorney that closed the purchase when they bought the property. Because they already have the title work. Okay. And all they have to do is the attorney will write up a document. They record it at the register of deeds. And it changes the form of ownership to the entireties. Okay. Terminating the entireties. Obviously, death of either spouse will terminate the entireties. If one spouse dies, the surviving spouse owns it in severalty. Okay. A divorce automatically converts the ownership to tenancy in common. Okay. So they still own it together, but only a married couple can own it in the entireties. If they get divorced or not married, they can't own it in the entireties. It converts to tenancy in common. Again, the important thing to note is that means they lose survivorship. Okay. They can enter into a mutual legal agreement to change the form of ownership. They can just go to an attorney and say, hey, we don't want to own it this way anymore. We want to change the tenancy or whatever. And the attorney will explain what has to happen and do it. But what the important thing here is you can get tripped up on the exam if you're not careful. When I say a mutual legal agreement, I'm not talking about a legal separation agreement. A legal separation agreement doesn't do anything to how they own the property for a very simple reason. They're still married. They may not be under the same roof, but they're still married. And as long as they're married, they're holding the property in the entireties. Um, just for information, the blue states are the entirety states. All the gold states use the form of ownership we're going to next, joint tenancy. And that's because joint tenancy comes out of old English common law. 
So the gold states are states that have never written laws changing that. So in other words, the way North Carolina made this happen, they, they wrote a law saying people who aren't married will be tenants in common and people that are married will own it in the entireties with survivorship. But since joint tenancy is in the common law, it is possible to create a joint tenancy in North Carolina, okay? It is not legally favored. All that means is it's not in our laws. It's not in our statutory laws, okay? So it can happen automatically. It is extremely rare. Buyers must insist on joint tenancy. And when I say they must insist on it, I'm not exaggerating. Um, I actually had some people in Charlotte that I was working with who wanted joint tenancy and they had trouble finding an attorney that would do it. It must be written with the right of survivorship to exist legally in North Carolina. Now I want you to pay attention what's on the screen. Notice the words with right of survivorship are in quotes. It literally must have those words in the deed. It's not enough that it just says joint tenancy. So the entry on the deed must comply exactly with case law. Case law is law that comes about as a result of lawsuits. Okay, lawsuits. Joint tenancy in North Carolina, the ownership interest does not have to be equal. It does have to have what's called unity of time. We'll talk about that next. So unity of time. Let's say we have three people who are buying a piece of land and they're going to buy and have equal shares. They're each going to own a third of the property. Okay. All joint tenants must purchase at the same time. So that literally means they need to have the closing on the same day. A, B, and C would have to sign all the documents at the same time, pay the money at the same time in order for there to be joint tenancy. Owner B decides they're gonna sell. Okay. They're gonna sell their one third ownership in this land to new owner I'm gonna call X. X is coming into the ownership at a later date. So X lacks unity of time. So why does that matter? It matters because since X lacks unity of time, X can't be a joint tenant. That's a requirement. X can't be a joint tenant. X will be a tenant in common with A and C. So buyer X is a one third undivided interest as a tenant in common with A and C. A and C are still joint tenants with the right of survivorship. A dies, C gets the property. C dies, A gets the property. X dies, his property goes to his heirs because X is not a joint tenant because he didn't have unity of time. So A and C continue to each own one third undivided interest as joint tenants with survivorship. X owns his property as a tenant in common with them, no survivorship. So when X dies, if he dies, it goes to his heirs. Whoever he's got in his will or his family or whoever's going to get it. And that's because X lacks unity of time. Came into the ownership at a later date. Now, joint tenancy
and this is right on the bottom of 14, joint tenancy has four unities, possession, interest, title, and time. We use the acronym PIT. Ownership shares must be equal, okay? Everywhere except in North Carolina. In North Carolina, joint tenancy is not even recognized unless written in the deed as joint tenancy with the right of survivorship and the ownership interest can be unequal. I've actually had, this was quite a while ago, this is probably 16, 18 years ago. In the same year, I had two students in pre-license that when I taught this, the next week, they brought the deed into class and showed me their deed and said, is this what you're talking about? And their deed, simply said joint tenancy. That's all it said. They will own it as joint tenants. And she said, are you telling me we don't have survivorship? I said, that's exactly what I'm telling you. She said, what should I do about it? I said, you take it to the attorney that wrote the deed, the one that closed the, the transaction, and you tell them to fix it and tell them not to charge it because they screwed up. And I said, you know, you can have a change. If you're married, you can have it change the entireties if you want, or you can you can leave a joint tenancy, but have them put the survivorship in there, either way. And then when the attorney fixed it, the attorney would have to record the document that made it right. So this is this is literal. This has to happen. And it's because joint tenancy isn't legally favored. We don't you normally do it that way. So <clears throat> this is a little video that's going to go back through these ownership interests just to kind of reinforce. Forms of ownership, tenancies in real estate. Tenancy and severalty is absolute and sole ownership of property by an individual or legal entity such as a corporation without co-tenants, joint tenants, or partners. Ownership is severed from all others with freedom to sell, gift, or devise, meaning to leave by will. Tenancy and severalty provides the owner with the most complete control of the land. With freedom to transfer ownership by sale, gift, or will, the owner in severalty may transfer title to a buyer, to a grantee by gift, or to an heir or a devisee who may hold the title in several T if a single party or by any of the upcoming concurrent forms of ownership that we'll discuss. Upon death, an owner in several T share would pass to his heir or heirs. Tenancy by the entirety is a type of concurrent estate, meaning ownership by two or more owners in real property that occurs when the owners of the property are married. Each spouse has an equal and undivided interest in the property. In essence, each spouse mutually owns the entire estate. In the event that one spouse dies, the full title of the property automatically passes to the surviving spouse who owns in severalty. We call this right of survivorship. Divorce changes tenancy by the entirety to tenants in common, allowing each divorce party to will to their respective heirs. Here's an example of tenancy by the entirety, which has been converted to tenancy in common after a divorce. Husband and wife each own a 50% tenancy in common interest, and as such, they can now will to their respective heir or heirs independently. Tenancy by the entirety is recognized by the states in blue. Tenancy in common or TIC is the next form of concurrent ownership. So when two or more people own property as tenants in common, all areas of the property are owned equally by the group. Co-tenants may have a different share of ownership interest. For example, Dan and Beth may each own 25% of the property while Phyllis owns 50%. And while the percentage owned varies, no individual may claim ownership to any specific part of the property. Tenancy and common agreements may be created at any time, 
So an individual may develop an interest in a property years after the other members have entered into the tenancy in common agreement. Tenants in common have the ability to sell their share to a buyer or will it to their heirs. Since tenants in common have the ability to sell, will, or gift their share of ownership, hypothetically, owner two's heir could own his 25%, owner three's buyer could own his 25%, and owner one's heir could own her 50%, and they could all own together in this fashion. Joint tenancy is yet another form of concurrent ownership by two or more individuals. It differs from the other types of co-ownership in that the surviving joint tenants immediately become the owner of the whole property upon the death of one of the other joint tenants. This is called right of survivorship. In order to form and maintain a joint tenancy, the following four unities must be in place. Possession, interest, time, and title, which you can remember through the acronym PIT. One, unity of interest. All joint tenants must have the same interest in terms of duration, extent, and nature, meaning all joint tenants must have equal shares. Number two, unity of possession. No joint tenant shall have exclusive possession of the whole property. Each joint tenant simultaneously with the other joint tenants must have an undivided share of the property. In other words, the tenants can't slice up the property. Three, the unity of time. All tenants shall vest at the same time and for the same period. In other words, all tenants must take title at the same time. Four, unity of title. All tenants shall acquire title through a single instrument or deed and have equal property title. In this three owner joint tenancy, owners A, B, and C each have a one third undivided interest in the whole. What happens if owner A passes away? Well, owners B and C would absorb owner A's share and own in joint 50-50. What would happen if owner C passed away? Well, here too, owner B would absorb owner C's share and own 100% in severalty. What then happens when owner B passes away? Well, since owner B owned in severalty in accordance with his will, his heirs one and two would own 50-50 in common. What happens if a joint tenant sells his or her interest? In this three party ownership joint tenancy where owners A, B, and C each have a one third interest in the whole. And owner A, for whatever reason, decides to sell his interest to owner D. Owner D would own in tenancy in common alongside owners B and C who would remain one third owners in joint together as they always had been. Owner D cannot join the joint tenancy because the unities of time, title, interest, and possession have been broken. Ultimately, if the owners could not agree to a recast of ownership, there would be a partition hearing and a forced sale. If during that time, owner C were to pass away, owner B would absorb owner C's share in accordance with right of survivorship and would own two thirds tenancy in common alongside owner D's one third tenancy in common share. Forms of owners. Okay. The next thing we're going to talk about, top of page 15, common interest community ownership. So these are ownerships that involve a community. They also can be referred to as combination or hybrid ownerships. This includes condominium, townhouse, cooperative, and timeshare. So we're gonna start with condominium. Condominium ownership is deeded ownership in real property own the individual unit. Now, crystal clear, this is ownership and there's a deed. Having said that, 
what the owner owns is airspace, the interior airspace of the unit. They do not own the ceiling, the walls, or the floor. Now, obviously, they have the right to use all of those, because if you couldn't, you couldn't live, okay? But they don't own them. How do they own the condominium? The same way they would own any real property. If they're one person, several T. If they're a married couple, entireties. If they're two or more people not married, the loan it is tenants in common. And in addition to that, so this is where the, the combination or hybrid ownership comes in. In addition to the ownership of the individual unit, they also own all the common areas as tenants in common through the Unit Owners Association. The Unit Owners Association maintains the common areas and the outside of buildings, and to support that financially, they collect dues. Now, it's really important when you're studying this to know the difference or know how condominium owners own the common areas. Because when we get to the next form of ownership, which is townhouse, it's totally different. And they love asking about that on the exam. So common elements, those elements, all owners have a right to use of. Stairways, hallways, elevators, parking lots, pools, tennis courts, the clubhouse, whatever's there. Some condominium projects have limited common elements, and this has become more common as time's gone by. Any common element reserved for the use of one or more units to the exclusion of other units. Garages, storage units, boat slips. Now, why do some owners have the right to use the these limited common elements and other owners don't? They pay for it. In other words, when you buy a condo there, if there's a garage available, you can pay and have a garage. If there's a boat slip available, you can pay and have a boat slip, but not everybody does that. People don't pay for it, don't have the right to use them. There is a law in North Carolina that regulates the sale and ownership of condominiums. Strangely enough, it's called the North Carolina Condominium Act, okay? North Carolina Condominium Act. Now, I want you to find where this is in your book. It's in bold, underline italics, and it says the North Carolina Condominium Act of 1986. I want you to take a pen in your hand, please. And I want you to draw a line through 1986. I want you to scratch it out, eradicate it, obliterate it, cover it up, obfuscate it, run out of words. Now here's the deal, here's why I do this for a very good reason. 1986 is correct. That's when the law was passed. The reason I had you cover it up was to make a big point to you. You do not need to know any dates laws were passed. Don't waste your time, energy, and brain space trying to memorize the dates laws were passed because they can't ask you. There's only one date in the entire course that they can ask on the exam. And when we get to it, for an additional fee of $100 each, I'll tell you what that date is. 
I got one smile out of that. You're a hard crowd, you know that? But seriously, you don't need to know what dates law was, laws are passed. So the Condominium Act applies to all condos. And I've emphasized all in the book. I've really emphasized it on the screen. So what do I mean by all condos? Residential, commercial, industrial. The only condominiums that aren't covered by the law are condominiums that were already created before the law went into effect. But don't fall into the trap of the Condominium Act being for residential condos only, because when, if they ask you about it, a lot of times that's a multiple choice answer. It's residential only. That's not true at all. And if you weren't aware there were commercial and industrial condominiums, there are. Industrial condominiums are much more rare, but there are, they're out there. Commercial condominiums, on the other, other hand, are common. I've seen signs advertising them, especially in Greenville, Wilmington, Charlotte, Raleigh. What kind of use do you think a commercial condominium would probably be for? What kind of people would want to buy a condominium to use in a business? Um, like a influencer? influencer, like someone that wants to work at home or have a small business in their house? No, no, because that you can do that in a residential condo. Office. That was my next question. Doctors, lawyers, architects. Oh, wait a minute. Real estate brokers. The point is, they don't want to lease office space. They want to own it so they can get the tax benefits of ownership and the appreciation and value if they sell it. You know, when you rent something, the only thing you get from renting is paper. They're called receipts. You rent a house for 10 years. At the end of the 10 years, the only thing you have is a bunch of receipts. The owners benefited from the tax breaks and the owners benefited from appreciation of value. Okay. So the Condominium Act applies to all condos as long as the condo was created after the law was passed, residential, commercial, industrial. And then again, you do not need to know, study, memorize the dates that laws were passed. Under the North Carolina Condominium Act, the consumer protection part of it, the developer must, one, record a declaration. And a declaration is an extensive count uh, document with all the details of the condominiums. 40, 50, 60 pages sometimes has to be recorded. They have to record a plat. Now, plat is a name for a map, okay? But it's not a tax map. Tax maps have no legal bearing whatsoever. Tax maps aren't even to scale. They only serve the tax office. So the plat is a two scale drawing of the entire complex, including all the amenities. And both of those get recorded the rest of deeds. The third thing is the developer must prepare the bylaws for the unit owners association. They need to get the owners association set up. Declaration, condominiums are created by recording a declaration. It describes a legal and physical structure, restrictions on use, describes party walls that separate ownership interests, specifies common elements and limited common elements. All that stuff is in the declaration, all the things we're talking about.
the North Carolina Condominium Act requires on new condominiums, meaning new construction, ever been lived in, three things. First thing is buyers must be given a public offering statement prior to signing a contract, before signing a contract. Second thing is they get a seven day right to cancel the contract. And the legal expression for that is seven day right of rescission. The word rescind, rescind means cancel. So they get a seven day right of, of rescission. And the third thing is the developer must hold any deposit for the seven day period. On the screen, I've got EMD, earnest money deposit, but it's any deposit. In other words, the developer has to hold the deposit. So if the buyer invokes the right of rescission, they've got the money to give back to them. There's no excuse for not giving them their money back. They can't hold it in a bank earning interest somewhere for 90 days before they give it back to them because it can't go to the bank. Now, if the condo is a resale or pre-owned condo, all the buyer has to be given is a resale certificate. And a resale certificate sounds like a very official document. The reality is it really isn't. All a resale certificate is, is a piece of paper that lists the fees, the, the, the unit owners association fees. Now, I've handled a couple of resale of condominiums and I have given those people the public offering statement that went with the condominium project but I wasn't required to give it to them. The law doesn't require it. The Condominium Act does not apply to townhouses or planned unit developments, PUDs. Now, it does apply to out-of-state purchases of condominiums if the papers are signed in North Carolina. So if you buy a new condominium in Virginia Beach, Myrtle Beach, Vail, Colorado, but you've signed the documents here in North Carolina, you get the full protection of the Condominium Act, including the requirement for the public offering statement, the seven day right of rescission and so on. Townhouse ownership. Now, it's, I want to, before we look at this, I want you to just look at page 15, the whole thing. Notice condominium covers up two thirds of the page. And then townhouse and co op share the last third. So we've got a lot more information on condominiums. The reason is, is because condominiums, for the most part, are the predominant combination form of ownership in North Carolina. But you know what else that tells you? You're more likely to get asked on the exam about condominiums. There's more things to ask about. Okay, so townhouse ownership is deeded ownership in real property. Now what you own is different. In townhouse, you own the individual townhome, including the interior party walls, and you also own the land the townhome sits on.
The easiest way to understand a townhouse or townhome, it is a single family home that's attached to another single family home. That's what it is. Condominiums, there's no ownership of land, which means they can be stacked and they frequently are. They look just like apartments. As a matter of fact, 30 years ago in Charlotte, investors bought up apartment complexes and let the leases expire and totally remodeled the apartments and then sold them as condos. They turned apartment complexes into condominium projects. They're stacked, there's no ownership of land. In townhouse, you own the shared walls, the land, all of it. The walls between condominiums are normal interior walls just like an interior wall in your home. It's just got, all there is there is a four inch stud as far as depth. They insulate them to keep the noise down. The walls between townhomes are firewalls. And the walls between townhomes actually go down into the ground. It's not just an interior wall. Very different construction. Again, you would own it the way you own any real property. If you're just one person, you own it in severalty. If you're married, you own it in the entireties. If you're two or more people not married, you'll own it as tenants in common. Now, the difference in the common areas is in townhouse, the HOA owns the common areas. In condo, all the owners own the common areas as tenants in common. In townhouse, the owners don't own the common areas at all. The homeowners association owns the common areas and maintains them. And of course, to support that financially, they also collect dues. That brings us to co-op, okay, co-op. So in cooperative ownership, there is no deed. There is actually no ownership of real property of any kind. What you buy is you buy stock in the corporation that owns the building. So the evidence of owning stock, of course, is you get a stock certificate. Then you need another legal instrument that allows you to occupy the unit you wanted. And where the areas where they do these, they don't call them units, they call them apartments. So what you need is you need a proprietary lease to occupy the apartment you want. There's no ownership of property at all, all but you own a stock. Now, are there some benefits of ownership? Yes. Okay, if you finance the purchase, you can deduct the interest on your, on your taxes. You get the same tax breaks. And the way you benefit from appreciation is if you bought a co-op apartment 10 years ago and you sell it today, if the property has appreciated, guess what else appreciates in value? The stock. So when you sell a stock, it'll be worth more and that's how you benefit from appreciation. Now, this is all you need on this, what I have on the screen, what I have in the book, because to my knowledge, the picture on the screen is the only co-op in the state of North Carolina. I said to my knowledge, I didn't say it was the only one, it's the only one I know about. 
but I've never heard about another one. You can see the K on the building. The building is called the Kimberly. It was built in 1952 behind Park Road Shopping Center in Charlotte. And the only thing I can guess is whoever developed it thought the Southeast was gonna go co-op and they were wrong. Combination ownership is at least 80% condo. And most of the rest is townhouse. See, here's the thing. You go to Chicago, Pittsburgh, Philly, New York, Boston. They don't have any condos. They're all co-op. That's, what it, that's how they do it, co-op. When you're watching a movie or a TV show and the characters talk about buying an apartment, that's co-op. That's exactly what that is. That's co-op ownership. Okay. And again, the only reason you're learning even a little basic stuff about this, remember 80 questions out of the 120 are national. Timeshare ownership, okay? Own the right to use a unit for a period of time over several years. In North Carolina, the, the, the law is antiquated, but, in, and I say it's antiquated because it, it names a specific number of times over a specific number of years. And timeshares haven't been sold that way in at least 15 or 20 years. But the law still says that. Now, that's all you're getting on timeshare right now because we cover this when we get the license law in the last section of the course, because that's where the timeshare act, the law that governs timeshare is. A planned unit development. Method of development, not ownership. Flexible zoning with mixed use. Single family, multifamily, commercial, office, recreational. Planned unit development is a lifestyle. Okay. HOA usually owns the common areas. So that's a drawing of a planned unit development. The, the concept of it is. When you leave work at the end of the day and you drive home, you don't have to get back in your car. They've got a boutique grocery store there, drug store, a few restaurants. They have recreational areas. That's the concept. You don't even have to get back in your car. Um, in Raleigh and Charlotte, they sold some of these and they sold like crazy. Uh, and actually uh, the couple I was familiar with in Charlotte were laid out better than the one I have on, a, on the screen. I just can't find a picture of it. They were, in, they were a big circle. So the homes were on the perimeter of the circle, single family, multifamily around the whole circle. And then the, the streets going in were like spokes of a wheel. Inside that were the recreational areas. And inside that was the commercial. So from any home in the PUD, the farthest you had to walk to get to something was a quarter mile. That, so basically, you didn't even get, have to get back in your car. That was the concept. There's another one. And if you look at the legend down in the right corner, so they've got hotel, multifamily, mixed use, condos and retail, medical office, retail grocery, and then residential, two different densities of residential.
need a little information about trusts. It's a fiduciary arrangement to hold property. What that means is people own real property and they give the ownership of the property to a trust. They create a trust. Okay. So the people no longer actually own the property. The trust owns the property. And people do this for various reasons, but probably the biggest reason is for uh, tax benefits. So a third party trustee holds the assets on behalf of the beneficiary. The beneficiary is the owner. Trust agreement sets the parameters of the trustee's authority. Trust agreement tells the trustee, this is what you can do and what you can't do. It may allow assets to pass outside of probate. So it wouldn't be inheritance, it's not taxed. Types of trust holding real estate, living trust created during the trust store's lifetime. Testamentary trust created by the property owner's will. So somebody owns real property, they have an attorney write a will for them, and instead of giving the property to their kids, they have the property go into a trust and their kids can use the property. Land trust, real estate is the only asset. Real estate investment trust, is, it's, uh, it's like a mutual fund in real estate. Mutual fund, you invest in the mutual fund and the owners of the fund buy the different stocks. Here you're investing in the real estate investment trust and the trustee of the trust buys different pieces of real property. Brokers should deal with the trustee regarding disposition of real estate. What that means is if I go out and list a property and I'm told the property is in a trust, then the trust will be the seller of the property and whoever the trustee is, is the one that's gonna to have to sign all the documents. Forms of property ownership by businesses. Okay, by businesses. Brokers may encounter business entities in providing brokerage services. Listing property, writing offers on a property where a buyer is a legal entity, managing rental properties. So, sole proprietorship owned by one individual that may have employees or independent contractors. This is the business, not the property. These are the different kinds of legal entities. So a sole proprietorship, which is actually an IRS term, sole proprietorship means this person has a business, but they have not formed any kind of legal entity, okay? The owner is liable for all aspects of the business. A separate real estate license is not required. In other words, some brokers do this in real estate. Corporation, a legal entity owned by shareholders to shield personal assets from corporate liabilities. And there's also tax benefits. An officer of a corporation would have to authorize the sale of the real property. Corporation must have a separate real estate firm license. So I don't own my school. I don't own the Roy Farron School of Real Estate. My corporation owns the school. Farron Real Estate Training, Inc. So on the wall behind me, the two inner licenses with the blue seals, those are broker's licenses. One's mine, one's Annie's. The one with the green seal, I'm trying to aim at it backwards. <laughs> the one with the green seal, seal is my firm license. That's the license for my corporation, Farron Real Estate Training, Inc. And the one on the other end with the black license is the actual school license. A limited liability company, almost universally referred to simply as an LLC. 
a pass-through entity that avoids double taxation while limiting liability like, like a corporation to shield personal assets from LLC liabilities. Owners are called managers or members. So the owner in a corporation is called an officer. Owners in LLCs are called managers or members. Only a manager can bind the LLC to contracts. So again, if an LLC owns property and is going to sell it, the name of the LLC will be the seller and a manager has to sign. Partnership, an arrangement by two or more parties to manage and operate a business, general partners share equal, equally in the profits and liability, limited partners are limited by their investment. Income goes to the partner's personal tax return, avoiding double taxation. A partnership must have a separate real estate firm license. So any legal entity has to have its own real estate license to practice real estate as a legal entity. And it's interesting the way um, you, you get certain kinds of legal entities in certain industries. Almost every real estate firm and builder I'm aware of is an LLC. Doctors, attorneys, almost always are partnerships. Now, I, I don't know what that, I'm just saying that's it's interesting the way that falls out like that. Okay. <clears throat> 